Okay, it's a pleasure for us to uh, have at the RUG meeting today, Dr. Rod Summy, who is a, uh, an expert on geospatial uh, data and remote sensing. Uh, we want to thank uh, CSTEM for allowing us to have our meetings in this room, and special thanks to Guillermo Garza, who uh, makes the miracle happen when, uh, when we're recording things. Turn the time over to you, Dr. Summy. Okay, well, thanks, Dr. Watkins. I appreciate the uh, invitation to speak to the group today. And what I'd like to talk on is geospatial data, remote sensing, and R. What geospatial data is, is uh, information that describes both the, the uh, locations and characteristics of geospatial features. And, and geospatial features are features that have both location and characteristics. So you're tying something with characteristic to locational uh, positions on the earth. Here's some examples, maps, they're both paper and digitized, uh, census data, uh, U.S. Census Bureau updates the uh, census data every uh, 10 years, aerial photographs, uh, both panchromatic, which are black and white, uh, conventional color and one and one type called color infrared, satellite imagery, there's, there's low, medium, and high resolution satellites uh, now. Um, elevation data uh, for modeling hydrological processes and things like this. Uh, and it's, they, they're uh, obtained by a variety of technologies, including uh, stereo photos, uh, stereoscopic viewing, synthetic aperture radar, and a technology called LIDAR that I'll get into here in a little while. And then thermal infrared data or heat measurements. I don't know if any of you saw on the news this morning uh, with a scare for, of uh, hemorrhagic fevers coming into the United States. Uh, one of the technologies that they're looking at very closely right now is thermal uh, infrared cameras. And by pointing uh, or having a camera mounted, you can measure the temperature of someone at a distance. First, anyway, uh, and there's many other types. Let me go through some of these and uh, remote sensing technology. Uh, what remote sensing technology is, is various uh, methods for measuring or uh, documenting features on the Earth's surface with, uh, from, from a vertical perspective from certain type of platforms like satellite, aircraft, balloons, uh, drones, and uh, using reflective or emitted radiation. And it's uh, been used for a long time. Here's some examples right here, aerial photographs. For many, many years, uh, we have, from World War I uh, on up to the present time, we've had panchromatic or black and white, very high quality aerial photographs for surveying and things like this. Uh, color infrared, for in which vegetation appears red, the military designed this back in, in 1942, early 1942, to detect camouflage military vehicles and they specified the Eastman Kodak that they wanted to film when they took a picture, anything that reflects highly in the so-called near infrared region, which is long, a little bit longer than red. We can see blue, green, and red. We cannot see past uh, 700 nanometers, which it gets into the near infrared. But anything like vegetation that reflects highly in that should appear red in a color infrared photograph. Uh, objects like uh, military tanks, which are green, uh, same as most vegetation, but they're green, but they don't reflect highly infrared. They wanted them to appear blue. And then r anything red would appear green. Okay, so the reason is they want to be able to fly very rapidly over a place, get aerial photographs at a certain altitude, and then document if there were camouflage military vehicles, which would be impossible to see in most cases with the conventional blue, green, and red photography or your own eyes. And uh, so anyway, this worked out very well. And after World War II ended, uh, a bunch of some research uh, was conducted that showed it was also very effective in detecting plant diseases because diseased plants reflect differently in the infrared or the visible than healthy plants. Different species have different spectral signatures. So this has been used since World War II very extensively for uh, crop monitoring, um, forestry, uh, land cover maps, things like this. So it's widely used. Okay, okay. Now beginning in 1972 with the Landsat program, 
uh, we had a moderate resolution satellite imagery and the Landsat system, which is one of the classic ones, at that time had a, a pixel resolution of 30 by 30 meters, which doesn't sound like much now, but if there's a huge archive of over the past uh, uh, 40 years that, that are available to the public minute. Much of it has never been analyzed, but the Landsat system took routine uh, uh, imagery of most of the Earth's surface, and it did that all the time. There's been seven, uh, there's actually, there's eight, uh, yeah, there's a land, it's gone up to Landsat 8 now, and, uh, but it's moderate resolution and it's designed to measure uh, over very broad areas, ch changes in the landscape itself, vegetation patterns, uh, urbanization, and things like that. Okay, we also now have high resolution satellite imagery. Uh, the Landsat program was the first civilian, uh, or not civilian, it was, it was actually NASA and uh, uh, USGS, but it was the first satellite system in this country designed for civilian uses to monitor the Earth's surface uh, for non-military purposes. Uh, and at that time, the uh, uh, very uneasy about having commercial satellites up for security reasons. But in uh, the 1990s, there was some laws, some changes in the law that allowed companies to go commercial. And now we have high resolution satellite Im imagery. Some of it is uh, in the meter range, in other words, one pixel is one square meter. Some of it is now in the half meter range. Now, there's a law, supposedly, in the U.S. that the military will not allow uh, uh, satellite imagery with, Im with imagery less than half a meter to be uh, released to commercial firms. But commercial firms now have satellites in the sub meter range, and so there's not too many ways to stop that. And plus other countries now have them. The satellite image of my house, you can tell which half of my garden is planted. Yeah. Two, oh, yeah. Two yeah. And bear in mind, these things, uh, the Landsat is 720 kilometers up. So these are high altitude satellites. Uh, this is perfect for wide area uh, uh, documentation of changes in, in uh, vegetation patterns and things like this. But it's not, it doesn't have enough resolution for things like city planning, roads and things like this, whereas this does. This is relatively inexpensive. This is very expensive, but it's available and it's used for different purposes. Uh, okay, there's a technology down here, a digital elevation model. This is elevation data. And this is the type of data that you have to have to model water flow. Uh, say for in our area to monitor the or uh, uh, develop flood control plans and things like this, see if the levees are working correctly. There's several ways to get this, including several types of radar, uh, survey instruments, uh, and then one called LIDAR. And what LIDAR is, it's a relatively new technology, and it's a scanning device that the aircraft flies up and has a scanner that goes back and forth like this and emits thousands of uh, laser beams at, at, for, per uh, minute or whatever, and it records the time that it takes that from the time it goes till it's reflected back, and measures that distance. And you can get with lidar, you can get uh, elevation to sub centimeter, I mean sub meter range easily. So anyway, these are all different types. This is by no means the only types, but these are various types. Now, along with this goes the field of spectroscopy, and what this is, here's, a, here's an area down on South Padre Island, different plant species. Different plant species reflect different wavelengths in different uh, manners, and uh, uh, with a spectroradiometer like this one right here, you can take a given plant, say this one right here, and measure what its um, uh, spectral reflectance looks like. And this goes from this machine we've got goes from 350 to about 1100 nanometers. Nanometers a billionth of a meter. And what it usually shows in a typical plant, healthy plant, is you'll have a low reflectance. This is right here, is in the this 400 to 500 is the blue region. We can see it, we have receptors for that. All right. Uh, 500 to 600 is green. 
600 to 700 is red. Uh, longer than 700, it goes into the near infrared region. Okay, we don't, we cannot see near infrared, but we can measure it in both with both instruments like this and with uh, aerial uh, color infrared imagery or some other types of uh, imaging uh, techniques. Uh, but what usually happens here, there's a low, uh, uh, invisible over here, a low, re a relatively low uh, reflectance of blue and red. The reason being, those are the wavelengths that are used in photosynthesis. So if a plant's healthy, the reflectance of blue and red is going to be low, relatively low, because the, the energy is being absorbed by the chloroplast. Uh, the reason most plants look green is because uh, plants do not use green wavelengths in photosynthesis, so they reflect it. So you get a little, have a little peak here. That's why most plants look green. They're reflecting green radiation. Now, when you get into the infrared, this is governed by photosynthetic pigments. Over here, it's a different matter. The leaf structure, if you, if you cut a, take a cross section of the leaf, you'll see several layers. And one of those is where gas exchange occurs. In photosynthesis, you have uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, entering the plant. Photosynthesis produces oxygen, and they both leave. They enter and leave through little leaf stomata or opening. Okay, these little air air pocket cells. Uh, the structure of those and the and the the condition of the surface of the cell is the fundamental determinant of reflectance in near infrared. Okay, if a plant gets stressed or you have two different species. The air cells are very probably going to differ, and they will they will show up in the near infrared. You, they may look identical in the visible, but in the near infrared they're different. If they if any plant or anything else differs in one or more of these regions, then typically you should be able to record that in with color infrared film, or some type of or with a spectroradiometer. Okay, so that's that's one of the tools. Uh, when you do all this, like get these. Uh, spectral radiometer graph, then you've got to uh, analyze it. And the way we typically do that is take a, uh, normally in our work over here, we'll take the uh, peak of the uh, blue absorptance, which is about 680 nanometers, they run, or five, uh, 489, 460 nanometers, and then the peak of the red absorptance, which is 680. Those are the two main ones used in photosynthesis, incidentally. And the peak of the green, and somewhere over here in the near infrared, and take four big areas in here, and then compare them statistically. So we have to we have to go through. Say if there's ten replications of each one of these right here, each one of these plants or whatever it was, we take five or ten replications, and we have to go through on the machine and get the the percent reflectance phase for each one of the replications there or observation, and then. Uh, average them and compare them statistically. Okay, so here's an example of that right here for these plants up here. Here's the blue, red, green, and near infrared. And here, the, here's different plant species down here. And you can see uh, you put conflicts limits on them and all like that and run a stat test. And in this case, most of these, uh, let's see, well, all of these ended up being uh, different. But nevertheless, uh, Whenever we get spectrating on data for calibrating the, the uh, remote sensing instruments or for, for determining if something should be or should not be detectable in film or other types of imagery, then you have to have to look at them statistically. In this case, uh, the difference is, uh, let's see, among these different plant species, uh, you can see right here, these weren't, these did not differ down here in, in the red. Uh, Let's see. These two are certainly not different. These two aren't, but this one certainly is from that. So you can say, well, we in this in this particular wave band, the blue right here, that there's going to be differences here and between these two plant species right here. But we probably won't be able to distinguish these with blue alone. If you put them all together, then if one of them differs substantially, then you should be able to, to uh, distinguish them. All right, and there's proprietary statistical analysis software, SAS. The one I've used for years has been SysDAT. Uh, but when they upgraded our machines recently, I got, I got a package when I first came down here. 
uh, when we got upgraded to Windows 7, my app disappeared, and I don't have the original thing. So now I'm going to have to grub around for software, which brings us to public domain software. And I, I am not an expert at all in R, but I'm going to become one for that reason. The, uh, if you buy a package like this, uh, the school has a site license, I believe, for this. But if you get a out, uh, if you order the full package, it, it, they can get fairly expensive. Okay, now there's also various types of software for image processing. Now let me show you something here that uh, uh, this is a spectral radiometer. Uh, these are spectral curves for, um, let's see, it's false spider mite damage on citrus. These are three little citrus plants, and we replicated this. This is, uh -oh, these are just examples of what you can do with some of the software. Uh, you can't see very well any differences up here. This is the visible, red, green, and blue. And uh, small spider mites, uh, when they feed, they call they typically cause damage around the leaf edges, and then they'll just wreck the plant. Okay, it'll destroy the the epidermal layers and everything else. But when you look at this right here, there's not too much difference. You can't see too much difference. When you look at it in terms of near infrared, this is exactly the same photograph. Uh, when you look at it in the near infrared region, then this this appears to be bright, uh, kind of bright red, and these are more of a magenta type color, purple. But it's still not real evident. You know, you got to kind of use your imagination. And if you had a million plants to look at, like in a greenhouse of an acre or more, and you were consultant and you're looking for very spotty type damage, it would be very difficult, even with in this past, even with near infrared to uh, make any sense out of it. But when you take, when you break the images down into the layer that was produced by red radiation only, the red region only, and the near infrared, and divide the near infrared by red, okay, and this is something you can't do with film. If you digitize it, you can, but when, when a, a image is recorded in numbers, then you can divide, add, multiply, take square roots, uh, powers, and everything. You do all kind of mathematical manipulations with it. And what this image is down here at the bottom, it's called a ratio image, and it's the ratio, each pixel represents the ratio between near infrared to red reflectance. Okay? And this has been used for many, many years as a way to detect plant stress. If you look down here at the bottom, it's a little bit hard to see. The healthiest plants are the green ones. The healthiest plant tissues are colored green and yellow here. And as you move up here, the middle, 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 mid type damage is in the yellow to, uh, uh, it, and then it starts fading into blue. The real dark areas are uh, plant tissue that has been damaged extensively. And if you look at this, you can't tell much difference here, here, but here it's the difference between night and day. And these are not sub substantial differences in damage. Uh, this, these, these near infrared red ratio images are used routinely in a NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration satellite called AVHRR that goes around the Earth and has been doing this for years and monitors plant growth worldwide. I mean, it, it, so you can see spring appearing uh, uh, when everything starts getting nice and green in different parts of the world. You can see where droughts are occurring and everything else, and also crop condition in worldwide. So that's been used for many, many years, but it's very simple to do in a little machine in the lab. Okay, so anyway, and you'll notice right here, the differences between these occur in the near infrared region. The visible region, they're almost identical. So you cannot look at these plants and see any difference or detect any evidence of plant, real plant stress. But if you look at a ratio image, it's very, very visible. The, the uh, uh, ones right here are the, and, and these two right here don't differ too much. And you can see they've got a uh, typical low, high, low, and then a plateau off here in the near infrared. And they're about the same. They don't differ statistically. But the ones with a with a moderate damage or heavy damage, uh, the decrease in near infrared reflectance is why you see these differences here. But we cannot see it with our eyes. We measure it with digital color infrared imagery or spectral radiometers, 
but you can't see it. Okay? So this is a way to detect plant stress very early before, in a, say in a greenhouse, so you can take action before you really start raising plants uh, from the uh, buildup of photosynthesis. Once photosynthesis is affected, then you start getting increases in red and blue because they're not being absorbed anymore like they were. They're being reflected. And as red approaches green, it says here's green, here's red coming up. When the, when the, when the red gets close to green, you see yellow. And we usually, uh, that's chlorosis, and that's usually associated with plant stress. But, you, but by the time plants start turning yellow, if you're a commercial greenhouse grower, you've got major problems. Okay? So this would be a nice way to... Uh, okay, now here's another tool in remote sensing that uh, most people are familiar with. If they're not, uh, they may not be as familiar with it as they should be, but okay. Uh, it's a, it's about, it was built by the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense. It is by far the most accurate radio navigation system ever developed. Uh, it's available worldwide, and you can go down to, uh, here's three different types of receivers. Uh, the, the distance to each one of these satellites, if you, if you knew where that uh, satellite was in that corner, this one, this one, this one, and you were standing here, and you put a string from there to here, there to here, there to here, and measured those distances, you could put, you'd know where you were. Okay, there's some ways to compensate for atmospheric uh, things, but anyway, this is measured by timing radio signals from each satellite, calculating how long it took to get there times the speed of light, and then measuring those distances, and that'll put you in an area of the Earth's surface. There's a lot more to it than that, but basically that's how it's, it works. Uh, you can go down to, this is a Magellan, this is my own right here, uh, for a hundred dollars or so and buy a GPS handheld receiver that operates on a single a single frequency. And if you uh, have a good satellite constellation and do a few other things to it, you can get accuracy three to five meters, okay? That is incredibly accurate. Uh, when the military first developed this, GPS, they wanted it to be approximately plus or minus 100 meters from where you were. You know, no, no closer than that, because they were worried about security. You know. Anyway, when when they when the when they developed GPS, though, it turned out to be so accurate it made them paranoid. So they came up with a process called selective availability, and what that means is they deliberately sent signals up to degrade the signal of GPS so it would not be that accurate. So they got it down to plus or minus 100 meters, uh, 95 percent of the time. But then an airliner was shot down over Asia because it's straight off course. And after that, they, it, it, it was using GPS, straight off course, got shot down. So they eliminated selective availability. They can still do it, but it wouldn't be productive because there's now two other systems from other countries that are in operation right now. And they're as accurate as GPS. Some of you realize that we're on the way. Huh? You realize we are online when you talk yeah. about Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you're right, yeah. So, better watch my tongue here. But anyway, uh, the, the, the uh, Russians have one, uh, GLONASS. The, uh, let's see, the Europeans have another one. Uh, the, Euro uh, the European Space Agency has another system, Galileo. But anyway, they all operate pretty much the same. Pardon? China's going to have one. Yeah, oh, yeah, and this, a lot of countries will have them. Okay, these receivers out here are about three to five meters accurate. Now here's a mapping grade receiver that's in the sub-meter range. And then here is a dual frequency survey grade receiver that has sub-centimeter accuracy. So with something like this, you can measure uh, horizontal measurements, latitude, longitude, whatever, in, in, uh, uh, with an accuracy of about five millimeters plus or minus uh, one micrometer. And in the vertical, like elevations, these are horrible for elevations uh, because of single frequency, but the dual frequency can get elevations in the centimeter range. Okay. Sync the clock. Yeah. Well, the satellites have atomic clock, 
and the uh, and they don't lose more than about five or six seconds, I think, in an average human lifetime. So that, but they also cost a couple of hundred grand a piece. There's two in each satellite. But anyway, so there's different types of receivers, but they're used almost universally now in uh, in research and uh, development of geographic information systems and so on. So they're a critical tool. Now, what geographic information systems are, the best definition, they're systems that are designed to collect, store, uh, analyze, query, and display geospatial data. And it includes the, uh, if you look down here, it includes hardware, software, data, methods, and also the people involved and the organization itself. So it's a system and it's designed to uh, uh, look at different layers of different things. You can take a, uh, uh, a say, an aerial uh, map or an aerial photograph with elevation data on it, uh, streets, highways, lakes, streams, and everything else, and, and do incredibly complex modeling and analysis. Uh, there's many proprietary forms. ArcGIS is one of them I was going to mention today, and then uh, OpenGIS, which is uh, OpenGIS, is a international group that promotes uh, GIS and to for, and interoperability between systems, and uh, it's it's uh, it does not have license fees. All right, so it's it's a very very good deal. All right, here's some here's some applications. All right, what this is right here, you've all seen contour uh, maps of. Um, uh, USGS topo maps have contour lines, and these are lines of equal elevation, okay? And a lot of people have trouble reading that. Some don't. Some can just picture it. But nevertheless, you can very easily uh, digitize those and convert that into what we call a digital elevation model. And this is a raster image right here. You'll notice the uh, highest elevations are in the dark green. It goes towards yellow, then red and blue. So these areas right here are the highest elevations. Each little pixel represents an elevation. Okay, so it's a, it's a train model, essentially. If you take an aerial photograph, aerial satellite photograph, or aerial uh, digital uh, photograph, and drape it over this, just like putting it right on top of it, then you get a three-dimensional model. And one step further, if you were one good use of this, is if you're working with an organism that had, I'll just give you an example. If you're working with an organism that occurs in mountainous areas with vegetation between elevations of 10,000 and 15,000 meters above sea level, it would be very simple to put in a command and outline exactly where that area is on these. They're already uh, on a coordinate system, so if you wanted to go to a certain place, uh, Get a GPS and a waypoint into it, and navigate to it, or go by. Ten thousand and fifteen thousand meters there, no such place. Uh, well, okay, let me bring it down. 8, what about feet? Yeah, but anyway, you just know what I'm getting at. Yeah, <laughs> even the Himalayas aren't that high. So uh, let's bring it down to say feet instead of meters. But the point is, you can put a command in there and outline the limits of the habitat that you were talking about. Another thing is slopes and things like this. If you're, if you're concerned about erosion in mountainous areas, there's been some really bad mudslides in different parts of the world, but if you were interested in developing a risk model, let's say for uh, avalanches or erosion, mudslides, then areas that don't have uh, uh, adequate vegetative cover and they've got elevations within and it's in a certain slope, then you can outline those areas and mark off areas that are, that are at various levels of risk to uh, uh, for for mudslides. Okay, so that's one use. And here's another one: uh, thematic vegetation map. There's all kind of land cover maps. Uh, this is just one example. These are some aquatic weeds, and here's the spectral profile for each one of these. Uh, Eurasian millfoil, water hyacinth, water lettuce, hydrilla, and parrot feather. Okay, what this indicates, most of these <clears throat> are fairly similar and divisible except water lettuce, and it and it's uh, different and divisible, especially in the green and the red. But and all these other seem to be, uh, and they, they were, they were statistically different, they were different in the uh, near infrared region. Okay, now by taking a 
this is an uh, this is a conventional color photograph that has uh, three different layers in it: uh, green, green, red, and infrared. Just with a typical digital camera, break those apart and take a pixel sample uh, from each one of these. Like this, they just have a little pixel sample, even though they look similar, they're all the same color green. And do what's called a supervised image classification, which means you get a for each pixel, you get a little spectral profile in the blue, green, and red of each one of these, and it'll put them into classes that you identify. You give samples of what this looks like, this looks like, this looks like, this looks like, and this looks like. And if you'll notice down here, when you do that, you get each one of these is very distinct from the other, especially this one and this one and this one right here. Uh, this is red, purple, and green. Green, 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 red, purple, and green. So, uh, and this is done at two different, uh, two different times, and they all both turned out the same way. Uh, so what that means is you should, by these differences that showed up here, you should be able to detect these with uh, color infrared film. Okay, so that's a nice little lab study. It also works in the field. Let me show you one example. <clears throat> Uh, this is a study that we did down on South Pond Island, uh, uh, model or uh, mapping out the distribution of black mangrove, which is a native plant that is very a very important shoreline stabilizer. These are aerial color infrared photographs, and it doesn't the lights are kind of dimming this out a little bit. But uh, anyway, there's various types of vegetation on here, uh, but this is a a supervised image classification of this image right here, and this is a supervised image classification of this color infrared photograph. And if you notice here, we took uh, sample pixel samples and a few of them in here and, and all around with different things. And this this uh, brown area is sand. The green areas are vegetation other than black mangrove, and the red areas are what we identified as black mangrove. And if you'll notice here, the bright red areas here, 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 and so on, uh, are black mangrove. And what it what this indicated to us, and it's pretty well panned out in most of these areas, is most, of, at least in this area, the black mangrove appears to be concentrated on the west side of these islands, south of the Arroyo, Colorado. And what our hypothesis is right now, we're still working with this, it's the reason that the east shorelines don't have anywhere near as much as the west is because of the wave action. For most of the year here, our prevailing winds are from the southeast, and they create waves that batter this part of the islands right here. And I think what happens is, it, is, is, it, is the currents take them around on this side, and it, the water is a lot more uh, calm in these areas right here. But anyway, uh, so this is a practical application of that. And here's a, uh, uh, no, it's two different islands at the same time. Yeah, these are, these are two different islands. They look similar, but no, they're different. And both of them have the same patterns, though. The, the mangroves seem to be pretty well aggregated on the, on the west side of the islands rather than the east side. Okay, now. No, no, no. These, uh, these, these right here are color infrared. Okay, this is actually color infrared film. A lot of the color infrared you can get now is digital. Okay, taken with digital uh, cameras. This is the old film, and the spools are about this tall, and they cost, you can't hardly get them anymore. It costs $2,000. <laughs> And it comes with an additional 750 to process it. So, yeah. But anyway, uh, so no, these are these are from film strips, but we scan them. Okay, I'm going to speed up here. Here's a poster that here's a good example of where the all three of these technologies come into. Uh, this is a student right here that did this last year, and uh, this was displayed at the uh, annual meeting of the. Uh, uh, Society of Subtropical Agriculture Environments at their annual meeting last year. 
And what it is, the use of GPS and open GIS technology, uh, open GIS technology for management of natural preserves in urban environment. If you take the, the, the uh, wetland park that we have up here, and there's a few others scattered around Edinburgh, they're small areas and they don't have a lot of money. Okay, but you still need some kind of tool to manage uh, land if you're going to do it. All right, so and so we looked at the uh, at ArcGIS, which is probably the cutting edge proprietary software, and QGIS, which is an open GIS that doesn't cost, it doesn't have a license fee. Both of them allow you to put the uh, data on the coordinate system, georeferencing, you can geometrically correct them. Uh, they have to uh, take raster data sets, vector, LIDAR. Uh, QGIS doesn't have a LIDAR module, uh, which is no problem because you can still get the digital elevation model. Uh, Multiband photography, both of them. A GIS server, uh, yes. And down here, license requirement. Uh, this uh, GIS has a license requirement, and to get a really uh, a minimal thing is about thirty-five hundred. If you were a commercial company, okay. If you're in, if you're a student or something, you can get things cheaper, but they use they time out, you know. All right, and there's no license fee here. And uh, but down here at the bottom, what it says: if you get the whole package for image analysis, GIS uh, server features, and all. A license typically costs up to seven thousand. So a small uh, operation like the Valley Nature Center in Westlake, uh, or the Edinburgh Wetlands Park, or or Net World Birding Center, are not going to be able, probably under most conditions, to afford that, and then to have people to run them. So this is an ideal way to manage land. On, and if you wanted to connect the different parks here in Edinburgh. Uh, with little routes, say that birds and butterflies could fly without getting killed, uh, a GIS would be an awesome way to do that. But anyway, so that's uh, something to think about. Here's some archives. There are huge archives available. Uh, I just listed the ones here that uh, that are concerned with uh, Texas resources. Texas Natural Resource Information System in Austin, TNRIS. You can go on uh, any of the search engines in TNRIS and you'll get right to it. You can download just about anything that they have. Uh, they have high resolution color infrared photographs, uh, very recent ones. They have LIDAR data. They have uh, all kind of other stuff. And, and then plus uh, uh, GIS maps and uh, census information, all that kind of stuff. So if you know where to get this, it, this is a concern primarily with Texas. Now the USGS has Earth Explorer and some other websites that you can go through and get uh, data for the entire country or world. And then uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture had these are two soil data sets. If you wanted to outline soil, say, all right, on Pan Am here, uh, what portion of this is under this type of soil, this type, this type, of this type, and, you know, for, as a layer, then it's, right, it's available right there. U.S. Census Bureau, if you want to do any demographic work, uh, uh, look at, uh, say, uh, uh, housing trends or median incomes or anything else. It's right there in the Census Bureau of data, and you can use that in GIS very effectively. Uh, there's, as, there is a uh, geospatial one-stop, which is run by the Federal uh, Office for Management and Budget, and it's a clearinghouse of GIS data. So you can go in there and shop around and all that kind of stuff. Then there's many private companies. The one that um, uh, developed uh, ArcGIS is the Environmental Sciences Research uh, Institute. Uh, there's many, many others, and they have all kind of uh, uh, imagery and uh, GIS data. And then there's the Open GIS Consortium, which has been for many years promoting uh, GIS. So they have all kind of uh, uh, stuff that you might be interested in. Finally, here's a here's about the last slide here. A powerful combo. If you take archive data, which you can get, which formerly the stuff that we looked at today, if you tried to buy that 10 or 15 years ago, it would cost you. Uh, it would break the budget of the university here, probably. It was very, very expensive. Now, you can, if you know where to get it, you can usually get very recent data for for essentially nothing. 
is especially if you download them. If you want a disc with the stuff on it, they'll charge you what it costs to copy onto a disc and send it to you. But it's very easy to download all this stuff. QGIS and R. Now, again, I don't profess to be an expert on R, but I'm going to because here's the common denominator of all three of these. Their public domain and the cost is minimal. They're also very effective. And you need all of these uh, R equivalents if you're going to work with remote sensing and GIS uh, operation. Uh, this, this, uh, uh, the cost of these and availability and effectiveness that allow small operations to have access to very powerful uh, geospatial technologies and uh, that were formerly only available to large companies and and then i'm going to use these in teaching my courses from here on out uh, because when you use proprietary software and i've got nothing against it but the problem is students are tied to a lab there's a certain lab section and they have to sit there and try to learn week by week uh, during that time only. And you can't take the software home. It's too expensive to buy. And, uh, and, and so if you had a open GIS program and, an, and a, 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 a statistical program that didn't break your budget, you could load them on your computer and learn probably twice as effectively as you could by coming to class all the time and sitting there for three hours and uh, then going home. So I think that is a, that's probably the, uh, the real value, and that's why I'm going to use these in my courses from here on out. Uh, let's see, question? Appreciate the opportunity. Okay.